Praise the Lord, everyone. No, that's all right. I mean, it's just, if I, if I can, I won't. Praise the Lord, everyone. Bless you, bless you, bless you. It's Wednesday night, Wednesday evening, and uh, we're here in Bible study at the Garden of Peace Worship Center. Amen. Located at 8301 uh, East 9th Street in the city of Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, we hope you're having a great day. If you're not, we're hoping that something said, a word, uh, or a song, or something that comes along, amen, will brighten up and help brighten your day. So today we're going to be in the 116th Psalm. Amen. We've been kind of, uh, God has kind of been talking to us and dealing with the Psalms because as we always say, the Psalms are, of course, it's Israel's hymn book, but in the Psalms, uh, many of these Psalms were messianic Psalms. Many of these Psalms were the ones that Jesus would quote from, and many of these Psalms, many times, uh, we would know that um, they are not, well, a lot of us don't know it. Many times these were songs that they would sing at the Passover. And this happens to be one. We're in 116. It happens to be one of those that was sang during the Passover. And actually I have three of them. One, 116, 117, and 118 were songs that were sang uh, during Passover. You know, and they were, uh, that uplifted them. And even though, uh, and it was a celebration of what God had done, how God had brought their ancestors out of Egypt. Amen. Had brought them with a strong hand. God Almighty had brought them out of Egypt land and delivered them. And he told them to observe, observe this Passover. And uh, so even down in Jesus' time, thousands of years later, they were still up to serving the Passover because it is still uh, looking back at what God has done and looking forward to what God is going to do and looking at present of what God is doing right now. So we're going to go into it and it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Because he has inclined my ear unto me, his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death encompass me, and pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Glorious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the, the simple. I was brought low, and he has helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with me. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And right before I go into the rest of it, those first few verses, those first uh, five verses, six verses, uh, actually eight verses, nine, amen. Those, I mean, that is the constant life that a child of God should have. And one thing we have to learn and one thing we have to do is become more consistent with God. And what I mean by that is that we don't just call on God out of our distress. Now, the writer here mentions that, but what he also says is even before that, he said, I love the Lord because he have heard my voice and my supplication." So even before my trouble, even before my tribulation, even before the things that I'm going through, the Lord has already heard me. So I love him for that. And we today, what we have to understand is that the Lord hears us when we pray. 
Doesn't mean he's going to answer today. Doesn't mean he's going to answer tomorrow. Sometime he does. The word of, of God came forth in Isaiah. He said, before you call, I already answer. In fact, let's turn there. It's in Isaiah. Uh, let's see. It's probably around 60. Uh, okay, let's, let's look. Let's, it's in the 60s. Yeah, 65 and 24. 65, 24. He says, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Now that's not all the time, but that is sometime. Why sometime when God needs to come right now, sometime you have a right now prayer. You know, where you're in a situation and you have a right now, you need God. When I was in the alley and the gentleman had the gun up to my head, I couldn't wait on prayer then. Or I couldn't wait and say, well, the Lord will answer me in a couple of days. Because in a couple of days, I'd have been gone. You know, so when I said Jesus, you know, now I didn't know Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that was his name. <laughs> I didn't know Jesus. But I knew I was in that alley, and I knew he had a gun, and I knew he was getting ready to get rid of a brother. So, uh, and they were speaking Spanish, so I didn't understand what they were saying. But I, I, I fixed in my mind that they're trying to say that I did something to them. And I didn't do it. I don't even know what they were talking about. I was just trying to get home from a party, you know, and I took the alley, and that's when they caught me. But when I was in that situation, uh, I said, you know, the guy said, well, yeah, get him, man, shoot him, man, you know, and the guy said, I'll kill you right now. And when he was saying that, I said, Jesus. And when I said Jesus, all of a sudden, they kind of like, you remember in the book, of, uh, I don't remember what book it is, but when they said that, uh, when they came to arrest Jesus, and all of a sudden he said, I'm he, and they fell back. Well, that's kind of how this happened, is when I said, Jesus, they kind of fell back. And all of a sudden one of the other guys said, oh, man, that ain't him. He didn't, ain't the one that did it. See, I needed a right now prayer, you know, because uh, if I had waited on the Lord, you know, like David says, sometimes he had to wait on God. Now, if I'd have had to wait on God, I'd have had some problems because they were definitely thinking about getting rid of a brother, shooting a brother in the head. And of course, you know, I was foolish and in sin. So as soon as I got away from them, got a little bit ways down, I cursed them out, you know. <laughs> and they could have shot me from there, <laughs> you know. But, uh, amen, when you're in the world, you know, you're kind of foolish. But what I'm saying is that so, but that was actually God dealing with me because after that, I mean, I went home. I was like, man, the Lord helped me. You know, all I said, when I said, I mean, it, it was indelible in my, in, in, in my mind that when I said Jesus, they backed up. That stuck with me. Even though I didn't know God, that stuck with me, boy. I was like, man, I mentioned Jesus. And they stepped off of me, you know. And so that was a right. So God said, before you even call, I'll, I'll answer. And before you speak, I'll hear you. So that was one of those. But that's not what the psalmist here is talking about. But what I like is that what he's talking about is something that is a, it is a consistent prayer. Something that he does all the time so I don't have to get ready. It's like a person trying to get ready for the rapture. And the rapture take place right now, boom. And all of a sudden he jump up and say, Father, forgive me. It's too late. Twinkling of an eye. It's too late to holler, forgive me now. It's over. So, yeah, you, you can't do that. You know, in those kind of circumstances, you know, you got to already have a prayer life. You already have to be studying. You already, you know, are preparing yourself to meet God. That's what the man said, I believe it's in Amos. He said, prepare to meet thy God. 
And amen. When you come to meet God, you know, you in anything, you better be on your knees. Better be before the Lord on your knees, letting him know I honor you. I worship you. I extol you, oh God. You know, I'm not going to walk in and meet Jesus and just stand there like, hey, what's up, God? You know, no, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. I'm going to be on my knees. I, I heard John, hallelujah. John in that first chapter of Revelation said, I fell at his feet as dead. See, I fell before him, man. He was prostrate on the ground. Said, my God. He said, I heard, heard him say, I am Alpha. I am Omega. I'm the beginning and the ending. I am he that which was and is and is to come, the Almighty. So at that point, I don't think John had a problem with who the Almighty was. Because I guarantee you there can only be one Almighty. If I'm Almighty, then I got all the power. That's something I used to say to people, you know, that they would come at me with Trinitarian stuff. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said in the book of Matthew 28, 19, he said, go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. I said, but right before that, he says to the disciples, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I said, now, I wasn't the brightest student in school. I will tell you that. But I did learn that if somebody has all the power, that means the other people don't have any. I said, now Jesus said all power. And of course, we know the word there is the word authority. It's not even, it's, it's, it's not the word, uh, you know, uh, dunamis for the power, you know, like in uh, Acts 1 and 8. It's authority. He says, I have all authority. So now, if he has all the authority, all the power, then how much power does God have if he's not God? And they were like, oh, well, uh, I said, no. I said, because now what I'll do is I'll align with what he said. He said, all authority. I said, when you look in the book of John, you'll see that Jesus said all authority had been given him by his father. So he did have all authority. Amen. So what I'm saying is that, so what we're doing now, we're sowing our seeds of prayer. We're sowing our seeds of seeking the Lord now. See, because what happened, people a lot of times don't understand prayer. Many of us were saved on the prayers of our grandmothers. They prayed prayers years ago, before you was even born, some of them. And then some of them, after you got here, and you didn't know grandmama was praying for you. But what happened was she was praying for you, or grandpa was praying for you, and God honored those prayers. Isn't, haven't we ever read where God said that his arms have come up as a memorial before me? Do you know who that was? Mm -hmm. Bible scholars, y'all know where that's at? Okay. I'm, you know. It's okay. <laughs> You're a little there. Right? No, no, no. I want you to, I know where it's at. <laughs> I want you to tell me where it's at. I know. <laughs> Woo. See, now I'm at home. When, when I teach, I'm at home when I do it like this. Because I want to hear from y'all. Amen. Amen. I'm not just going to be give a discourse. I want some interaction. He said the arms have come before God as a memorial. Lord, yes, Lord. Ooh, Father. Hallelujah. See, what that is saying that even unsaved people. Acts 10. Thank you. Yes, okay, sir. read it, brother. Since you, says, prophet. No. <laughs> <laughs> read it, prophet. Acts 10, Cornelius, the prayer is heard in thy own or had in remembrance of the sight of God. All right, all right, all right. Amen. See, now, he wasn't saved. But, he 
prayed anyway. He prayed all the time. He sought God even though he wasn't saved. So even, you know, it's just like, hallelujah. Turn it. In our book, Crucial Triumph, hopefully you know none of y'all out there, there's a scripture that they use and they say that God heareth not sinners. Because there's a scripture in the book of St. John. And it said that, for we know that God heareth not sinners. But that's one of those scriptures where, you, first of all, you got to understand who's talking. See, because that's not true. All through the Bible, God heard. When, 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 <laughs> my God, when Ahab humbled himself, God heard him. And he definitely was a sinner. The Bible says Ahab was the worst king had ever been born. He said, I'm going to cut off from him every male, period. He didn't say it like that, but I ain't going to say it like that. But that's what he said. He said Ahab was the worst king, and Jezebel was worse than he was. He was what you call a, and my pastor, Bishop Robert W., would call him henpeck. He was henpeck. Because he did everything the wife said. He didn't have his own mind. You know, he was a henpeck brother. Uh, you know, she told, I mean, how you know? First of all, when Elijah had, had, had God had killed the prophets, I mean, his false prophets through Elijah, uh, Jezebel said, not, not Ahab, Jezebel said, he gonna be just like my prophets tomorrow. And he ran, Elijah ran from Jezebel. He didn't run from Ahab. Few days later, few days later, Ahab is walking around moping. And Jezebel says, what you moping about? He said, I offered to buy that, that vineyard right there. And Nate, I think his name was Nabal. He wouldn't sell it to me. She looked at him and said, Ain't you the king? What do you mean? You take that from him. You ain't nobody. I mean, this was her. And what did he do? He did that. And then Elijah came and said, you're wrong, man. You're not supposed to. I don't care who you are. You're wrong. And the Bible said he repented. And, re you know, but he was, that's what we call him. Okay. That's an old word. But, you know, you old, you my age or a little bit younger, you've heard that many times, you know, but if not, you probably never heard that word. But that's when no backbone and, and whoever else is just, they just guide you wherever you do whatever. And that's what Ahab was. So as bad of a king as he was, his wife was even worse. And she the one ran the throne. He, he didn't run the throne, she ran it. She told him what to do. Amen. And so it's just like when you get God's uh, order out of order, that's what you get. That's what you get. You know, you get when, when, when the order gets mixed up, then you're looking for chaos. You know, and that's why we seek God first. We were, we're looking at the 116th Psalm. For you. <laughs> he said, I love the Lord because he have heard my voice and my supplication. You know, you have to know God's heard you. Doesn't mean he answers all the time, but you know he's heard you. Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus. Look at, look at chapter 11 of uh, St. John, chapter 11. I, I, this happens to be one of my favorite scriptures, even though it doesn't seem like it should be, but it is. And it's, it's uh, verse 42. Well, it actually starts at 41. Chapter 11, verse 41. It says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Now, he hadn't even prayed yet. But he had a relation with God to know that God is. He, he said, God hears me all the time. He says, and I know that thou hearest me when? Always. Always. That 
is confidence to know that God hears you always. That's powerful. And remember, anything Jesus had, we can have the same thing. He told us we could. So I can know that God hears me always. As long as I stay in the book, as long as I walk with God, I know he hears me always. So he says, he says, but because of the people which stand by, I said that they may believe that thou hast sent me. <laughs> so, yeah, so he, they hear, he said, God, I know you hear me always. See, and that's what the man is saying here in the 116th Psalm. He said, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication, even my deep prayers, even my prayers where I'm hurt." Even my prayers where I'm going through situations. And it's not always the devil necessarily. Sometimes it's family stuff. Sometimes, you know, it's just things going wrong in your life, you know. And you're, you, you begin to, where they call you, you do supplication. You know, you, you, the back in the day, we had prayer meetings. You go down, the, you went down the altar. You Sometimes you didn't hear them saying words. They just be moaning. Mm, Lord, you know, you know what I'm, mm, I mean, they would be moaning because they couldn't even say half the stuff that was going on in their life because a lot of it was so deep in their soul. So that's a supplication. That, but I know even in my groaning, even in my moaning, I know that God hears me. I know he hears me. Why? Because I love him. I love him because he hears my supplication. He hears my voice. See, that's one thing, and we know that. How do we know? Because he has washed us in his blood, cleansed us from all iniquity, gave us his spirit. So he says, uh, because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. I mean, your prayer, God has inclined his word. He's inclined his ear to hear your prayer. It means he wants to hear you. You're not bothering God. You know how sometimes, you know, when you have children, they come in, all, like especially and you have office, like you have president. I remember President Kennedy, his, his kids, you know, they were little, little kids when he was in office. And they would run into the White House and they, oh, daddy, 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 you know. Uh, but he inclined his ear. That was a joy for him. Whereas some others may say, I'm at work. What are you doing here? You know, God, get these kids. But it was a joy for him. And that's the way God is with us. It's a joy for him to hear us talking to him. To hear us, and he inclines his ear to hear us. He said, oh, my child is calling. You know, I hear his voice. What do you need? See, and that's how powerful God is. And that's how loving he is. Oh, I'm talking to myself now. If I just knew how loving God was, how loving he is toward us, how he wants the best for us, if I could only understand that, a lot of this stuff that bothers me wouldn't bother me. If I understood how much, I mean, we can look at the cross and all he endured, and a lot of times we still don't understand how much he cares for us, how much he loves us. And, 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 and when we grasp a little bit of that, because we're not going to grasp all of it until we get to glory. But when we grasp a little of that and know that everything Every step you take, every move you make, God wants it to be your best. God wants the best for you. He kept telling Israel, I want you to have the best. I want you to be the best. I want to take care of you. He had a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide them. Today's guidance is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost 
He said, they that are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. But he had a cloud so they could see, and all that represented was his presence. When we understand on Mount Sinai, God didn't have to do any of that. Thunderings and lightnings, and they looking up on there, and whoa, and then he don't have to do any of that. He chose to do that to let them know, I'm here. I'm here, and I'm a force to be reckoned with. Whatever you're dealing with, you don't have to worry about that, because I'm a force to be reckoned with. And he said, you are the apple of my eye. Now, if your children are the apple, you don't have children, I know. You know, if your children, you know, are the, <laughs> you got children? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you were saying something. See, I have children, okay. But I'm just saying, if they're the apple of your eye, you don't want anything to happen to them. And uh, a situation happened to my daughter a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week. And you should have saw the rise in her when somebody was messing with one of her children. And that's the same rise in God when somebody's messing with one of his children. I mean, she was like, uh, I'll be there tomorrow. I mean, you know, I did the head movement and all that, you know, because somebody messed with my child. And that's what God is saying to us, is that uh, you're the apple of my eye. And if they messing with you, they messing with him who sent you. If you are witnessing and because of the gospel's sake, somebody hit you, somebody trying to, you know, like they were getting persecuted and all that. He said, they're not persecuting you. They're persecuting me. See, because you wouldn't be out there if it wasn't for me. You wouldn't be telling the story if it wasn't for me. So, hallelujah. Amen. So, he inclines his ear. He says, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. When God has done, see, and this is what, that's why we go from faith to faith. When God has done things for you, when he has inclined his ear for you, when he has heard your prayer, heard your situation, heard what you're going through, heard and answered and strengthened, and sometimes he doesn't have to strengthen, I mean, the answer, he just needs to strengthen you. Sometimes it's not the answer is not the answer. The answer is you got to get better. You got to get better. You got to grow. This situation will help you grow. See, we learn from nature that that's why they have, uh, if they can't, say they capture a lion and as a little cub or whatever, and then the lion grows up, say, in a household, they don't release that lion back into the wild because he don't know how to handle that. Because the wild itself, God has made it so that the wild toughens him up to become the lion. So if he misses that experience, he don't need to go back out there. And they do that for all kind of animals. You know, They say, well, you're in captivity the rest of your life because you can't handle whales and stuff like that, orca and all that, down in Sea World and, you know, Marine Land, used to be Marine Land. You know, those, they can't be released back into the wild. They're not ready for that. Because here, 12 o'clock noon, they feed them, throwing the fish out there. Come get them. You're not doing that in the wild. You got to go get your own food, you know. But so, yeah, you got to go get your own grub. You got to find you a seal. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I tell you, when you see nature, I, a lot of my grandkids watch a lot of National Geographic and stuff like that. And, and it, it's just nature, but it just, sometimes you just feel so sorry for the willowbees and the you know, wallabies, whatever they are, you know, and the, and the, uh, the different animals that the, the, the lions have to eat. And I'll never forget seeing one where the sea lion was on a block of ice and this mother orca was teaching her children, her, her little, uh, little whales, how to hunt. 
And so she just kept nudging him. She wouldn't hit, touch, she wouldn't eat him. She just kept nudging him where he would move over here. He would, she was teaching them how to hunt for this seal. I felt so sorry for that seal. So after she had taught them, all of a sudden she hit that block of ice and there was nowhere else for him to go but down in the water. And of course they all grubbed on him. But I'm saying, is there some things that we go through that if we don't go through, we won't be the people God is looking for. You can't handle the stuff that God has for you. You can't handle the ministry. I'm not talking about just handle bills and stuff. I'm talking about ministry. God said, if you can't deal with the little, how can I put you over much? You know, if you can't take care of your house, how are you going to take care of the house of God? That's what he said. He said, how are you? You can't take care of your own household. You don't have your people in order, and you're going to take care of my house? Because that, that is a kamikaze, oh, if that's a word, uh, <laughs> of the church in your household, and you can't handle that? And now you want to come and be pastor? It ain't going to work. Don't work like that. You, got, you go from faith to faith. See, because you learn. Boom, boom. I mean, I look at my journey. I look at your journey. I look at others' journey. And I can see where you had to go through. The, there's steps. It's just like whether it's on your job to be a certain rank or whatever, your job to be a whatever rank and things like that. I mean, you got to go through steps. Not going to bring you in there and put you over people. And you ain't never been under nobody. And that's definitely true for the church. People want to come in from everywhere, haven't served nothing, haven't been under anybody. And they want to lead people and don't even understand people. This position, you have to get an understanding of people. Sister uh, Dr. Jennifer. Genevieve Shepherd was my teacher. They just uh, gave her a street named after her in LA. She taught understanding people, awesome class. Because if we are the people of God and we don't understand people, that's, our, that's what we do, people. So if we don't have an understanding of people, we in the wrong profession. And if God calls us, then he prepares us. Whether it's on your job, because your job prepares you for your ministry. All of that. See, it doesn't, it, well, you know, that's not spiritual. That's just natural stuff there. I don't have to work. But that's part of it, too. God uses the natural things to help you in spiritual things, too. Yeah. You know, you're subject to somebody. People that's out there don't have nothing. They're not subject to nobody. Those people are scary because they can do whatever they want to. They can just jump off and say, hey, you know what? Let's go to Guyana and let's drink uh, uh, Kool-Aid. And people say, why not? And that's why Jim Jones was able to do that. Get a whole bunch of people together Go all the way to Guyana and say, drink this Kool-Aid and die. Now that man used to be a Pentecostal preacher. Preach the word. Nobody covering him. So then he slowly inched into foolishness. That's the reason why you have covering. Because people slip into foolishness. They good at the beginning. But then they slip away into stupid stuff, you know, stuff they hear. Now, there wasn't no TV like that when he was there doing that. But I'm saying, you have to be careful. You need covering. People that, that's why people have pastors. People, I'm, I'll sit at home and watch TV. That's not the pastor, though. Bishop Jakes can't pastor you unless you go to, a, what's the name of this church? Potter's house. If you don't go there, he can't pastor you. Because 
He got people there. He's pastor. And he can't pastor you from TV. Same with all the different ones. They out there getting out the gospel. They're putting it out there. They're encouraging people and everything. But they don't consider themselves your pastor. Because they know pastoring, this is probably 30% of pastoring is what I'm doing right now. Pastoring is more dealing with the people than it is preaching and teaching. It's a lot more to it. You know, that's why God say pastors after my own heart. Pastors that love me. That's the first criteria. And how do you do it? By this 116th Psalm where he says, I love the Lord. See, because what happens is as you develop that consistency and you develop that life with God, your love for him grows and grows. And, and God begins to show you things, marvelous wonders out of his word, how he cares about us, how he loves us, how he just, I mean, he orchestrates things in your favor. Orchestrates. I remember when I got saved, and after a few years of being saved, uh, I was assistant. I was we had our own young people department, and I was assistant. Uh, and I, actually, at that time, it was actually Pastor Horn. I was his assistant over a group called the Hour of Power. Well, what happened was he moved up, and Bishop put him over the whole youth department, and I was his assistant. Now the Lord had told me, said, you're going to be youth pastor. I wasn't to think of that as a big deal because I was already in the assistant. So, okay, you know, but now what happened was I got sick and I was out of the norm for three years. They brought in a youth pastor from Baltimore, all the way from Baltimore. And I'm looking at the Lord saying, now, Lord, you said, to make a long story short, they had a youth pastor from Baltimore. They had another guy who became the youth pastor after she left. They had another guy who became the youth pastor after he left. You know, he went to start a church. And then with Probably, the, if I told you the story, the craziest way it could happen, I became the youth pastor. But God had promised it to me. And then what he did was, and he, you know, he took me around the 40 day, I guess, the 40, 40 year plan. And what I'm saying is that God had promised you something, and then is when the journey starts. Because when he promised it, I was like, ain't no big deal. I'm next in line. But by the time it came time for it to happen, I wasn't nowhere in line. I wasn't the one that should have been chosen at all. And then God said, all right, now I'm going to show you my power. And he said, okay, you the youth pastor. I'm like, whoa, that's deep. But when he promises, that's when the journey, you know, Lord told me I'm going to have a house. All right, that's good. Because then a lot of times when stuff start going wrong, <laughs> stuff start falling apart, you say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got my money in the bank. I'm ready and everything. And you can't find the house. Say, wait, no, 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 not that one, not that one. Okay. Oh, how are we not qualified? We got 800. You know, credit score. I mean, God is allowing you. So when you get it, you know he did. He does that. I love it. You don't love it while you're going through it, but he does that because what he wants to do is get the glory. So he'll take you round about, round about, round about. You think you're going in a straight line? He'll take you round about, then boom, here you go. Then you go. You look like, oh Lord, I can't believe it. Yeah, you can believe it because that's what God wants the glory from it. And if we walk with God, that's how he gets it. Because even though it looks like it's easy, God has a way to 
to make sure you understand. So when you get up and testify, you can say, you know, I went in places my credit was tore up from the floor. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I went to one place which was, y'all ever heard, he, he passed away now, but if you're on Cal Worthington, Cal Worthington used to say, this is my dog's spot, and he have an elephant. You know, or he said, this is my dog's spot, or he have a, uh, he'll have a snake. He, he was just, that was his advertisement. But he, he had a little place, and I went there and tried to qualify for a used car. And basically, they said, brother, uh, we can't help you. Your stuff is towed up. I said, okay. Now, left the place, and then uh, several months later or whatever, came back and, and went to another place and ended up with a brand new car. And they, I used my uh, uh, credit union, and the car was paid for when I walked out the door. God said, see, I told you what I can do. I mean, I was trying to qualify for a used car and couldn't. A car that had 64,000 miles on it. I walked out with a car that got eight miles on it and paid for it by the credit union. I paid the credit union back. I'm just saying, uh, no, there's no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. But a lot of times he takes you a different way because he wants you to understand. See, if I had never went to that used car lot, I would have just thought, hey, well, you know, they let everybody get through. But when I went through that and said, ooh, my stuff is messed up. Now when I get the car, I'm like, this is nothing but the Lord. He does that. He does that. Hallelujah. He does that because he wants us to know. That's why the man said, I love the Lord. He has inclined his ear. He's heard me. He heard me. He thinks about me. Hallelujah. I like the scripture. It says, cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. And that scripture, uh, the literal is that because you are his constant concern. Constant concern. He's always looking after you. He's always looking for you. Look, you know. I mean, and if somebody loves you, if you can find somebody to love you like that, you found something. You know, we talk about marriage and stuff. If you can find somebody that is as selfless as that, you found somebody. See, that's always thinking in your best interest. You know, that's why you talk about godly husband, godly wives. It's hard to find them. Hard to find them. But when you find them, you found a blessing. You found someone, and what you don't want to do is mess it up once you find them. You know, the ego tripping. Ooh, I said that like that brother, yeah, ego tripping. Oh, yeah, yeah, she gonna always take care of me, you know, and I can do whatever I want. Oh, you headed for disaster, you know, because nobody gonna let you do everything you want. You know, that's not biblical. The Bible says that you both supposed to nurture one another. Let me get on that. I have no idea. But, uh, and I wanted to get down to as he says, his sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. And he done inclined God three times. First, he just loved the Lord. He just talked to God anyway. Then he went on. He said, the Lord has inclined his ear to me. Now he said, the sorrows of death is upon me and the pains of hell. And I found trouble and sorrow. So now he's dealing with different situations as he goes on uh, with this song. Things that are happening to him. Things are getting a little bit deeper now. And he's beginning to cry out to God. It says, then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. And of course, we know from the uh, 12th chapter of uh, uh, Romans 
That beseech means I beg you. I beg you. A strong word there is he's begging God. Things have gotten bad. Things have gotten terrible. The pains of hell are around me. Death has come past me. Lord, I need help now. He says, and I beseech you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. See, he has to remind himself. When we're in prayer, you got to remind yourself of who you're talking to. You got to remind yourself sometimes you're going through so much. And you're, you're dealing with so much that we forget who God is. So he has to remember that God gives favor. He is gracious. And he's righteous. What does that mean? It means that he will. I like what, what Abraham said. Uh, he said to one person, he said, Shall not the judge of the earth do right? God is always going to do right. God is not going to deceive you. Like we talked about Jeremiah last week. Jeremiah said, thou hast deceived me. God's not going to deceive you. That's why the psalmist says, thou art righteous. That means you're going to do the right thing. Whatever I'm dealing with, I'm going to have to deal with it. But you are going to do the right thing in my situation. My situation will be dealt with, but it will be dealt with righteously. So he said, the Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return, I tell you, he hit in the gamut of things. You know, he helped me. I was brought low. The situation has bothered me so that I now am on my, I'm prostrate on my face saying, Lord, you got to help me. See, if this is happening to you, the psalmist is writing to let you know you're not alone. You're not alone. You've been through, people have cried before you got here. People have been in turmoil before I got here. People have been through uh, uh, many things before we got here. We're not the only ones that have troubles. We're not the only ones that have trials. He says, the Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. Soul was at ease at first. When he talked about I love the Lord, he was at ease. You know, he was just going along with life. Life was smooth. He was skating like a being at World on Wheels. He was skating through, you know, and life was cool, but he was still praising God. He was still worshiping the Lord, still giving God glory. But now it done changed. You know, I don't know uh, how many of you from back east. Uh, probably none of you. <laughs> you were from back east, right? Were you, you were born in Ohio? I was in Indiana. Indiana, okay. Well, you was probably so little. Back east at any time? No, we were born and raised. All right, all right. Well, I'll tell you, when I used to go to Pittsburgh all the time, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, man, you'd get up in the morning, it, the clouds would be dark. It would rain like crazy till about 12 noon. 12 noon, choo, you never know it was rain. You'd be like, what happened to all that rain? And that's the way our lives are sometimes. Sometimes your life is just, whoo, 12 noon, you just skating, and you just, and then all of a sudden the storm clouds come. You get home from work and, oh, honey, I got to talk to you. We got some situations going on here. You know, things have jumped off. And so that's what the psalmist is saying, man, stuff was cool. But now I feel like, I mean, I went from cooling it to where I feel like I'm in hell now. And I'm like, Lord, you got, I mean, I am supplicating. I'm calling on God. I'm brought low. And I'm calling on God. Things can change, I tell you. One thing I learned in life, if I don't know nothing else about life, is things can change like that. Life is unpredictable. You can walk out of this building and you're just as carefree and boom, something, you know, I think about the young men in Paris, California, the, I think it was a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. The, they had some guys out there that were driving, you know, racing, killed both of those kids. You know, those parents' life changed immediately. That, when 
they got up in the morning, they weren't thinking that. When they were driving that way, they weren't thinking that until that car hit. And then their whole life changed. So life is very unpredictable. But what we have to do is be predictable. What do you mean Daniel was predictable? When they got together and said, look, Let's put this edict together. Let's put this law together that says anybody that gets up and prays to a different God said, we're going to put them in the lion's den. Well, they knew. Well, they knew what time Daniel was going to be praying. The world, the, 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 you know, the Medes, the Persians, all of them knew exactly because he did it every day. Same time. He got on the window and called on his God. So all they had to do was walk by there and say, there he is. He's doing it again. And they arrested him. So what is happening is he prayed before the storm. Because how did his life change? Darius didn't want to do it. Darius said, no, no, no. But I, I, I signed the law. I can't change. I can't, I can't be wishy-washy as the leader. But well, Daniel had already prayed. See, he was getting up every day praying, praying not only for himself, praying for his people. See, because Daniel understood that you pray this right here, this right here. God said he'll deliver. Lord, your word says you're a deliverer. Your word, that's what the psalmist was doing. He said, Lord, you're righteous. I know, because your word says so. Your word says this. Daniel, of course, we know the story. Daniel was put in the lion's den. Of course, the lions didn't eat him. But what's even more important when I'm talking about praying the word is Daniel was praying about their captivity. He, was, he said, Lord, you told Jeremiah that 70 years we'd be in captivity. And you bring us out. Lord, that 70 years is almost ended. It's time for you to act on your word. And God sent an angel on the run to give him the message that, yep, it's almost time, brother. You know, so praying the word of God. That's why you got to know it. See, you got to know that healing is yours. You got to know that strength is yours. You got to know you can endure anything because the Bible said endure hardness as a good soldier. When you are in a, when you're a soldier, you don't do what you want to do. You do what the general says. What it is today, a lot of people ain't never been in the service. They don't know anything about being a soldier. So they figure I do whatever I want to do. I'm in church, but I do what I want to do. It don't work like that. Soldiers, the general gives it to the what the lieutenant or all that. The lieutenant gives it to the sergeant. The sergeant gives it to the enlisted people. And this is what we're going to do. Not what you want to do. This is what we're going to do. And when a person doesn't do that, a lot of times they get other people killed. When they got a plan, and they say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to carry this out. And one person says, well, you know what? I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to do it this way. And if you're in those trenches and you're in those foxholes and stuff like that, and you got a buddy in there with you that's like that, a lot of times they either going to get themselves killed or you killed. Because the general knows. Because a lot of times to be a general you had to go through, matter of fact, I know you had to, you had to go through the steps to become one. So you're not talking about a person that, well, you ain't never been through what I've been through. Well, I've been through something though. Because you don't just get those stripes for nothing. You know. Ah, glory. Amen. Amen. Now I'm talking about military. <laughs> I'm trying to get down there and do another scripture. He says, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee, even in the midst of it.
God has dealt bountifully with me. God has dealt, I mean, I can't understand it. There is, he says he gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. We don't understand it, how a person can have such tragedy in their lives and yet still have joy in their heart, still have forgiveness. It's, un it's not understandable for those of us who have not been through it. But he says, the Lord has dealt bountifully. See, we have to understand that even when bad things happen, God is still good. See, just because you lost your job, God is still good. God's goodness is not predicated on your job because God, number one, is going to do something better for you. You're going to find something better, do something better, or maybe you're going to start your own stuff. But he doesn't allow things to happen to you unless somewhere it's going to bless you. So he says, let me look at that. All right, got four minutes. Wow, I couldn't get to that scripture. May have to go with, uh, I was trying to get down to uh, where he says, for thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, that's our scripture. I believe and therefore have I spoken Hallelujah. I believe, therefore, have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. And uh, I was trying to get down to what shall I render. But I'll get back to that in two weeks. Next week will be a young minister will be speaking from here on next week. So the week after, I will be uh, back and I will go right from there. And we will go from there. Uh, this week, young people in charge, young people service, come out, be with us. Uh, allow the Lord to move in your life. Uh, as soon as I get the date, Pastor Carl Johnson will be speaking for us. I'm not sure if it's the 27th or if it's the 3rd. Uh, it may be the 3rd. So uh, he will be our guest speaker. He will be here and uh, we're going to let God use him. We have uh, consecration the week, consecration the week of the 27th. And, uh, and then we have communion on the 3rd of June. So bless you all. May God richly bless you is our prayer. Have a great evening. Remember, uh, prayer tomorrow night starts at 7 o'clock, 6.05. 475-2090. The access code is 1453769. Come and join us. You have prayer requests. Let us know. In Jesus' name, God bless you.